Met Jesus on a pilgrimage, still walking. I'm Andy Doyle, the Bishop of Texas, and that's my six-word autobiography. My hope for this podcast is to walk with you and talk with you about God, the church, and where we're headed next. Unfold, a lamb of your own flock and a sinner of your own redeeming. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. My name is Andy Doyle. I'm the Bishop of Texas, and am grateful today to have been invited by uh, your bishop and uh, your dean to offer a word on today's uh, lesson. So thank you very much, uh, and um, it is good, it is a good thing to be with you. Last week and this week, and actually over the next couple of weeks, those of us who come to church on a regular basis are going to hear a lot about the end times, these apocalyptic times. We're making a transition in our church seasons, and so the readings, whether they are from the Old Testament or New Testament, are going to cycle through over a period of time uh, talking about Uh, what is to come to pass, that no stone will be left upon a stone, that people will rise. These are the words that you heard in our readings uh, today. Uh, Perhaps uh, this is a little close to home uh, for uh, those of us who are concerned with global politics or American politics or politics in general. Uh, it, sometimes it can feel like the end of the world has already happened, in fact. Um, I, uh, uh, in my social media feed, there popped up a, a, a meme uh, that uh, uh, I've seen from time to time, uh, but it came back, it seems to fit today's lessons. It's a, it's a picture of a, a bookstore window, and, and it, it says, please... Note, says the sign, the post-apocalyptic fiction section has moved to current affairs. (laughs) Sometimes I think we don't know what to do with everything that is happening around us. And we can be at a loss emotionally, mentally. What are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to act Um, And I think sometimes what we do is we take the world's ways of reacting and we try and figure out our our next steps, quite honestly. Uh, And uh, I think when I think about that and our meager attempts to try and rethink politics, economies, and all these things, I I think a lot of the Grand Inquisitor and Dostoevsky's Uh, book, The Brothers Karamazov, who finds Jesus out in the world healing people and says, well, we can't have that. And so the inquisitor grabs Jesus and throws him in prison and says, look, you left us with all this freedom and we didn't know what to do. It's a giant mess. And so we created the church. (laughs) And uh, you uh, left us and and the truth is that people are just feeble, he says. This, you know, this is Texas version of Dostoevsky. Uh, He says, you know, people are feeble, they need a lot of help and guidance, they're sinful, and the church has given them a way uh, to proceed, to live life. He believes this was the right thing to do, the inquisitor. Sometimes I'm concerned that the great gift of freedom that is given to us, as the book of Hebrews says, from Jesus upon the cross, is actually too much for us. I think that at times, chaos, violence, and hardship, the truth is that our God's not big enough and our freedom not grand enough to imagine what we might do. When apocalyptic fiction or apocalyptic Apocalyptic visions become too real. It's not that the faithful God has failed us or that God's promises have not come to pass, but that we have failed to have a God greater than those things that face us. 
our, our God does not, cannot meet the time in which we live. Uh, God, I can't turn my life over to. A God, I can't, when I am out of control, give control over to. A God who is and is to be, but is rather small. What we have today and in the weeks to come is a good bit of this literature, and it's going to keep pressing at us. It's going to keep inviting us to imagine a great God, a God bigger than you're imagining, a God that will do things that can't, we can't possibly conceive of, a God that will bring to end all the things of this world, a God whose love will conquer, a God who will not allow death to have the last word, a God who will say, no more darkness, there shall be light. Come to me, martyrs, let me gather you in. This is the God that we worship, this grand God who will do things different than the world does. A God that Micah K., a New Testament scholar, says essentially a God who is working on behalf of humanity and creation a God that is alarmingly free and open to the future. And I love those words. A God, I want us to imagine in this time, in this moment, as we face whatever we face, whether you've come today burdened by family or friendship or, or maybe burdened by the state of the world or politics, whatever it is that you've brought Today, to this altar, I want you to imagine a God that is alarmingly free to help. Alarmingly free to love. Alarmingly free and interested in a future. Jesus and the other authors of Scripture use this idea but we too often get all, oh, oh, the stones of the temple. We get like, we want to know. We're like the disciples. Like, when's this going to be? It has already happened, says the book of Hebrews. It has already started. It is already unraveling the things that are, are already falling away. Death has been put to an end. Only life exists. We are living in the meantime, in between God's great victory and the foreign shore of heaven and life and glory and light, we are invited to be faithful in this alarmingly free and future-oriented God who is greater than we can imagine or hope for. And so we... If we follow that God, we'll discover, I believe, that we are set free. We are set free to turn our attention to God's future, to what God is doing, to love God most of all, yes, and to then wrestle with the call to love another and others and neighbors, humans, humanity, most of all, but to love not just our friends, but even our enemies. This is the alarmingly free God that we follow. This is the uncomfortable God we must wrestle with. Our freedom is in giving, doing, and acting not as the world does, but as a freedom-loving, freedom-giving alarmingly free God does. Christians have always lived, always lived in between the earth which is falling away, as the scripture today says, and the heaven which is not fully revealed. We live in a time today which calls not for seeking shelter, but rather for being shelter in the storm of the world's fear. We are the ones who, like Jesus, can see the times and seasons for what they are when we follow this God, and to let go to what ourselves are typically clinging to, and instead grab a hold 
of Jesus' robes, if you will, turn our head towards God's distant shore. While the plans of humanity will always, as they have always been, rise and fall, to listen to God's groaning creation as it heads towards its fulfillment, you and I are free of worldly expectations of revenge, darkness, and hate, such that we may go together with our alarmingly free God who beckons us and points the way to a heavenly future. And so what we discover then is that truly the sign speaks a truth for Christians. That embracing this free apocalyptic God moves us gently but with strength into whatever current affair we face. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for listening. Join me in conversation on Twitter, at Texas Bishop, and spread the word about this podcast by leaving a review on iTunes. Thank you.